Today, March the 11th, is World Kidney Day, and to underline the current circumstances around the disease, the World Kidney Day Steering Committee has declared 2021 the year of living well with kidney disease. A statement on its website said, this has been done in order to both increase education and awareness about the effective symptom management and patient empowerment with the ultimate goal of encouraging life participation. We're now going to have a discussion around this with two gentlemen. First, Dr. Ade Damola Akinshiku, a nephrologist, certified cardiopulmonary resuscitation resource person and head of clinical services at Healing Stripes Hospital, and Olisa Agwakoba, lawyer and senior advocate of Nigeria, who is a kidney disease survivor. You're welcome to the program, sirs. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning and thank you for having me. Good morning. Uh, well, Dr. Akinshiku, let's start with you. I mean, I looked at the theme of uh, today's uh, World Kidney Day, living well with kidney disease. Uh, how possibly can anyone live well uh, with kidney disease, particularly when it is uh, maybe <laughs> chronic, CKD, or when there has been an organ transplant, all that anxiety? How can anyone manage that? Uh, you know, the emphasis on living well. Well, so first and foremost, um, good morning, Nigerians, and thank you for having me once again. Um, yes, chronic kidney disease, but like you rightly said, when you hear that word, um, chronic kidney disease, it, it's not just um, talking about kidney failure. There's so much to it. There are different stages of chronic kidney disease. So and when you talk about chronic kidney disease, it does not necessarily mean that, oh, the individual has to go on a dialysis machine or the individual has to end up having... Um, a renal transplantation. The vast majority of individuals with chronic kidney disease usually do not even have symptoms. Um, there are five different stages of chronic kidney diseases, and from stage one to stage four, the vast majority don't have symptoms. The ones that you end up seeing coming on air, you know, either requesting for arms or begging for, for some form of assistance, are uh, typically the tip of the iceberg. Uh, they account for less than about 1% of the total population or total number of people suffering from kidney disease. So it's important to know that the vast majority of individuals suffering from kidney disease resides in the community. And um, we would like to use the opportunity to create one and create awareness and try to educate individuals suffering from kidney disease on things that they need to do right. Um, first and foremost, let me say that the most important cause of kidney disease in this part of the world is hypertension, which is high blood pressure. And like we all know, high blood pressure is a silent killer. Now, the vast majority of individuals suffering from hypertension resides in our community, resides right here with each and every one of us. I was opportuned to conduct a study in Lagos State in 2015 and found out that about approximately 30% of adults residing in Lagos State are suffering from high blood pressure. And about 11.7% of adults in Lagos are suffering from um, chronic, one form of chronic kidney disease or the other. Now, what, how can individuals live well with, with chronic kidney disease, which is what the team is all about? First and foremost, they need to be aware that they have this problem. And our duty yeah. as healthcare practitioners is one, to help sensitize them, two, to empower them so that they understand what the risk factors for either the, the disease progression or even coming down with the illness have been issue, what they are. And like I right, rightfully said, hypertension is the commonest in this part of the world followed closely by diabetes. You have other concussion ingestion. You have all sorts of unorthodox you know, um, medications being sold out there. The way people abuse over-the-counter medications in this part of the world also accounts for a large chunk of, one, of, of the causes of chronic kidney disease. So if we must live well, we need to start looking at our habits. We have, need to start looking at the things that we indulge in. C cigarette smoking, sedentary lifestyle, you know, I often tell most of my patients that um, if you look back 30, 40, 50 years ago, the kind of obituaries you see are people in their hundreds. You have an elderly man at 80 still taking on a new wife and being able to father a child. <laughs> most adults nowadays 
dare not. At 50, you're almost shutting down. That's the reality of life now. Now, if you look back and compare the health indices back then to what we have now, you find out that the health indices now ideally should be better off looking at the fact that patients are better informed, doctors are better you know, educated, they are better equipped, you know, the information is out there. The access to healthcare is now you know, readily available. But when you compare that to the health indices that we had in the, you know, maybe in the 60s, in the 70s, and early 80s, we're worse off. People don't live into their hundreds any longer. In fact, nowadays, if you live up to 80, people are celebrating you as an icon. But then, 70, 80 used to be a painful exit. The difference is majorly our lifestyles, and we need to, you know, pull back a bit, reflect, look at the things that we need to do right. Exercising, as simple as that is, it does not require you've seen a doctor or someone you know, probing or bearing down your neck. Drinking mm -hmm. adequate amount of water, rehydrating yourself you know, ad adequately. I'm not talking about soft drinks, just plain and simple. Drink adequate amount of water, about three liters a day. That would be appropriate. Um, avoiding or stop a cigarette, cigarette smoking, a reduction in the amount of alcohol you ingest, all these things have been shown to assist in reducing the disease burden that we now have in front of us. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. I'm going to go to you, Dr. Agbakoba. Can you please share your experience with kidney disease and why is the advocacy you're doing here this morning important? Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, it's important that I do share because, like uh, my doctor said, by the way, I, I, I applaud the my doctor, Dr. Kinshiko, is one of the best nephrologists in the world, which, which is why I'm talking to you, because I had absolute kidney failure, dialysis, and I, I bounced back. I think the first thing from the point of view of a layman is awareness. Had I been aware, I first noticed that what is called GFR, something that measures the, 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 the performance of the kidney, had gone down to 51, which was not good at all. But I, did, I took it for granted, kept drinking my whiskey, didn't give a toss. So awareness is important. Second thing I would say is do not go to quacks. You know, all these guys who come to your home and say they are doctors and all that. So I had a quack doctor come in to see me, taking my lab test, and I didn't know that my creatinine level, the creatinine level is the first indication of things are really bad. So by the time I got to Dr. Akinshiku, I was absolutely in trouble. So what I'll tell people is, make sure you are conscious of your state of health, for sure. Make sure you understand. Don't, don't, don't just rely on your doctor. This is from personal experience. Make sure you understand how to read that lab result. Make sure the medical jargon is different from the layman jargon. So I did a lot of reading, a lot of intense reading research, which aided my understanding of what to eat, how to eat, how to exercise. And I thought that it was important. And I, I, I think maybe Dr. Kishiko will, conf will confirm. As a result of uh, his own expertise and my own di discipline, I am perhaps one of the shortest stayed dialysis patients in his hospital, because I was there uh, for, I think about two, three weeks exactly. So awareness is crucial. It's something that you can live with, but you have to understand it. You have to be disciplined, which is not easy because even till now I'm struggling with my lovely whiskey. Not easy at all, I can tell you. But he's always telling me, my doctor, that look, the last test I, I think I had a clinic last year, last time, uh, last with him, and he said, I can see that you are still misbehaving. Uh, there is still whiskey in your. I can see the alcohol in your system. And it doesn't help you. So that discipline will, will have to be applied very fully. So on a World Kidney Day, my own experience is to tell people I, I, I beat it. And if I could beat it from the stage of kidney failure, anyone can beat it with discipline. Thank you. Mm. I mean, very powerful story there, very moving story there. Uh, Dr. Kishiko, you said a lot, and I'm really excited. But 
Why is it that we don't have a lot of talk about the need for kidney? I mean, if today's not World Kidney Day, no push. And what is the hospital doing to be able to put this mainstream out there that once your kidney is gone, then it's almost all over for you. And the fact that you can beat it back, I, I want, why is that there's no more publicity about it? You know, I'm sure we'll just only do this round today and it's all over. We don't talk about it again until next World Kidney Day. How can we sustain the conversation? Well, so um, thank you for the question. The first thing is that we have to, you know, get the government buy-in. If we don't have the government backing for anything you're doing, you're almost doomed to fail. Um, I mentioned earlier that I conducted a study in 2015 in Lagos State, and I could recollect vividly what I had to go through, going to allow her to get permission. You can't just go out there and, you know, start creating awareness, start giving out pamphlets and bills without getting approval from the government. Because, you know, people with other motives could go out there and do the same. Um, so the first thing is getting the, the health executives, the people in government, to ensure that they you know, get their backing so that whatever you're doing, you know, they're like the rubber stamp. That's one. Two is that I could tell you vividly that the NAN, which is the Nigerian Association of Nephrology, um, have tried in their own capacity, the executive members, to you know, reach out to the federal government to have this done at, uh, at a higher, higher um, scale. And I could also attest to the fact that healing stripes have taken steps to do this over and over. We do this annually. At times, we run in the entire week of screening. You know, and even though this, our establishment is owned by City of David, we really do not you know, um, pay attention to your, your religious um, beliefs when it comes to health seeking, um, 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 giving individuals the opportunity to use our facility. Um, I, I can say this categorically that it's important that the government must be ready to do their own bidding, must be ready to give, you know, make things easier for the experts to come out and create, talk about these ailments talk about these diseases so that we can educate the people. There has to be a formal, you know, um, formal arrangement, creating the conducive environment when you just come out there and preach what they, or talk about what, what, what they sell or what, 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 what they're doing. That's extremely important. Without that, we are not going to make the right um, improvements that we all desire. Yes, we talk about what, um, kidney disease or celebrate World Kidney Day every second Thursday in the month of March annually. But can't just, you know, we can't restrict it to this because virtually all the organs in the system work in, in what seemingly looks more like a vicious cycle. If one is affected, the others will also definitely get the prompt. For instance, the kidney gets about 25% of what the heart pushes out. So if there's something wrong with the heart, invariably it will affect the, the kidneys. More than 30% of individuals in the ICU will have some degree of kidney impairment or the well, other. Dr. Akinshiko, yes. uh, let's take a break, a short commercial break, and then we'll come back to you and Dr. Agbakoba. Thank you. Please stay with us. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on the Arise News Channel. Today is uh, World Kidney Day, and the theme is Living Well with Kidney Disease. And we have two guests, Dr. Ademola Kishiku, a nephrologist, and Dr. Ulisa Agbakoba, uh, SAN. Uh, Dr. Kishiku, let me come back to you. Uh, when I uh, asked you that we were going to a break, you were about to make a particular point. If you may just go ahead before we ask the next question. Okay, so basically, um, I was trying to just um, um, reiterate the fact that there is no way we can make um, appreciable um, improvement in creating awareness if there is no government backing. And I must use this medium to um, say, yes, the governments are trying, but we need them to do a lot more than what we presently have on ground. 
there is, there need, there is a, a, a cogent need for them to create a formal, um, accessible means and make things, you know, cut down some bureaucracies that we'll have in the government um, setup that we presently have. It makes it difficult for well-meaning Nigerians to easily want to do things. If I'm going to create, for instance, decide I want to create awareness around me, the bottlenecks that I need to, you know, the bureaucracy and everything that I need to go through to achieve that, and what at times I need to part with, both financially and physically, you find out that it's, it's, it doesn't make things easy. It doesn't make things seamless. It doesn't make it, you know, it doesn't encourage well-meaning Nigerians to want to give their best to um, helping and assisting the individuals around them. That's the point I was trying to air before we went on break. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Agbakoba, let me come to you. Dr. Akinshiku just talked about what government can do. Uh, maybe you would like to comment on that also. What exactly do you think uh, government can do? In some countries, they have health insurance schemes. Uh, we don't have that here in an effective sense. And then again, how costly is the uh, treatment? Because uh, when you hear about dialysis, I mean, it's like a death, death sentence uh, in the ears of some people. They will say, oh, that's expensive. And you hear all kinds of uh, figures. But you've been through it. Uh, so those two issues. Yeah, on the first issue of health care, I mean, generally we see what COVID has done and how African countries in general have been unable to cope. I think what will help, because when I had my kidney issues, I, I, I found it even difficult to locate until I just got into healing strike. So the paucity of centers that do dialysis in Lagos is shocking, given the high numbers of people with uh, chronic kidney disease. But I don't think government can do it all alone. What government needs to do is to articulate a well-defined national health care policy that can enable private sector actors to, to key in and provide. In the UK, 30% of healthcare is provided by and driven by the private sector. There are lots of people here who can take healthcare as a business. So I think that's the way that we can proliferate uh, kidney centers. There are very few kidney centers in Lagos, you know, shockingly. On the point about it being uh, expensive, obviously, if you have very few healthcare centers that deal with um, kidney issues, then the costs are certainly very high. I had to do dialysis three, three times three times a week, and the uh, uh, city of God that, that bought um, Healing Stripe, being a religious-based uh, hospital, is one of the cheapest in Nigeria. But I can tell you that it's extremely expensive to do dialysis three times a week, because the first thing that happens to you is whether you can control your kidney impairment without going on dialysis. Now, if you go on dialysis and it, it keeps going, getting worse, now it's just speaking as a layman, and you get to the end stage, then clearly dialysis is no longer very helpful. You are not looking for a transplant. You are going to either India or uh, the United Kingdom or America. I remember telling my doctor, I think she could look, give me the worst case scenario. Now, if I needed a, a transplant, what would be the cost? Where would I go? And he gave me the options of, uh, I think it was um, Lassut and India and America and the UK, and all terribly expensive. It's, a, it's not something that people without funds can, can cope with. Therefore, a national health uh, insurance scheme is very important. We hear this story about the executive secretary of the National Health Insurance Scheme stealing billions and billions. It's so shameful. This is money that government should have properly invested in, you know, health insurance. So I think this opportunity, um, World Kidney Day, should awaken government to the responsibility of providing a framework where health care can be delivered cheaply to people but with a strong framework to bring in the private sector. So I have a question to ask both of you gentlemen from the medical and the legal perspective. 
Our National Health Act of 2014, Section 55, deals with organ donation and transplantation, which we know is a huge problem in Nigeria because of the issues that we have regarding, I don't know, superstition and what have you. But that provides <clears throat> that informed consent should be written in a will witnessed by two people. But can you imagine what happens in Nigeria, where a lot of people don't like to write a will? Even if they write a will and they agree to be organ donors, by the time the will is processed and what have you, I'm sure the organs are no longer viable. What needs to be done to really drive organ donation? Because all of us, if we ever needed an organ, would happily receive one, but none of us want to actually donate. How do we address this? I want to start with Dr. Agbakogba first. <laughs> I thought you would have asked Dr. Akishiko. No. Who is the doctor. I'm putting you on from the my spot. own layman's point of view. I think from my own layman's point of view, it's an advocacy thing. There is a Nigerian Medical Association. And I think they ought to vigorously promote people should have donor cards. Because that's the key thing. That's what happens abroad. A donor card, and you say, on death. I donate my heart or my kidney or whatever. So it's not really about a will. If you have a donor card, that's the authority for uh, uh, the pathologist or whoever deals with it to take away your organ. So I think that the issue here you, you speak to uh, Tundung would be one of massive awareness by the various um, uh, professional groups that run medicine, including the National Association of Nephrologists. We have about a minute left. Dr. Akishiko, what should be done to drive organ donation? Thank you for the question. I totally agree with um, Mr. Bakoba, But I must also say that it goes beyond the will to want to donate your, your organ at, um, when you eventually pass on. Because um, if you do not harvest these organs within a short period of time, I'm talking about minutes to a few hours, the organs start to, you know, the cells of the organs die off and then it becomes useless. And even when you harvest these organs, how do you preserve them? How do you contact, how do you convey them from one point to the other? It means you must have the database of all the patients that will require some form of organ transplantation. You must have done some you know, assessment on who, they, who, who will benefit most from that particular you know, organ. And how do you then store the organ so that you can preserve the cells of this organ? And power is one important thing when it comes to that. Means of transportation is one thing when it comes to that. And when you look at all these things, we are nowhere near that. What we basically even are trying to achieve now is being able to do the living donor pool more often. You know, the living donor pool more often. And it's still, we are nowhere near getting the best out of that because we need to sensitize people the more. We try at our own individual you know, level, when you have a patient with chronic kidney disease, at times you need to, or end-stage renal disease, at times you need to screen about five, six individuals before you get a favorable match. And at that point, you know, you've sensitized at least five individuals about it. I've had instances where individuals will come up and say they want to donate, and then they'll come back to you when the intending recipient is no longer there and tell you, please tell him, that my organs don't match. So in front of the intended recipient, you are all out saying, I'm ready to donate. But when you leave the individual with the doctor privately, the individual is saying, doctor, please just well, tell him my organs don't match. So well, we need doctor, to raise a lot of doctor, awareness. Dr. That. Akenshiko, Ulis uh, Agbakuba, SAN, we want to thank both of you. Thank you uh, very for much. Thank this, you. You know, this opportunity to learn more about uh, kidney disease. Thank you very much.